it's time to get your music radio ready with the Audio Skills Podcast. It doesn't matter what type of music you're creating or what gear you use. It's all about the technique. Get ready to turn your home studio into a place where your music goes platinum. Now give it up for your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Scott back again with a new episode of the Yes College podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about how to get that pro sound that everyone wants when making music in a home studio. And joining me to help explore this will be Ken Therio, founder of Homebrew Audio. But before we jump into that, it's time for your audio tip of the week. The audio tip I have this week is about how to get inspired. When it comes to writing music, recording it, mixing it, or really doing anything creative, so many people want inspiration. Inspiration is the key to creating something truly special, right? Unfortunately, many musicians and producers struggle with finding inspiration and motivation to create. If that's ever happened to you, don't worry, you are not alone. It's happened to me too. My tip for dealing with this is simple. Stop waiting to be inspired to get to work. If you want to write music, then write music. If you want to mix music, then mix music. Sitting down and working on something is how inspiration happens. You won't just sit there and suddenly be inspired to make an awesome mixing decision. It'll happen when you've forced yourself to sit down and start mixing. It will happen when you're working on projects. The best way to create unique, inspired music is to realize that it's more about just doing and getting better. Inspiration comes from that. So if you haven't set a schedule or aren't someone who says, well, I don't know, I'm going to work on audio for 20 minutes each day, you may be hurting your chances of finding that inspiration you want. And that is your audio tip of the week. So now I am so happy to introduce Ken Therio, musician, recording engineer, audio producer, voiceover actor, and founder of a number of websites, including homebrewaudio.com. So when it comes to recording and mixing music and getting great pro sound, Ken certainly knows his stuff. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Right on. How are things down in San Antonio these days? Well, they're cold and gray, which is very un-San Antonio-like, but uh, (laughs) carrying on best we can. Yeah, it feels like everywhere, uh, you know, it's just been very cold this winter. Uh, I have a a buddy who's down in Houston, and he's like, it's 12 degrees down here. It's ridiculous, you know? Yeah, So. Well, to start us off, could you tell us just a little bit more about your career in audio, the things you're working on today at Homebrew Audio and and elsewhere? Okay, well, as uh, any musician out there can probably relate to, I uh, never got a major record deal um, Mm -hmm. because, you know, 99% of actors as well as 99% of uh, musicians um, go about their work day to day without, you know, a whole lot of uh, people knowing what they do. So uh, Mm I started out in high school, I was in bands. um, And and I was always, always, you know, let's, let's, let's do whatever we can to get a record deal. And then I got uh, to, I got accepted the Air Force Academy, which um, that's where I went to college for four years. And you don't have a lot of free time and you can't, you know, like go on tour or skip classes or anything. But um, <laughs> it didn't stop me trying, you know, still I had uh, a band there and uh, and we um, started writing songs and recording there at a um, a local studio. A guy had a basement, you know, and he'd charge us whatever uh, an hour to go record. And we had singles back then. I, re- I recorded back in the days when... Oh, uh, singles. <laughs> yeah, little little round discs of uh, acetate or whatever they were made out of. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and I thought I could send these to record companies, you know, and they're going to think they're, these are great and they're going to want to, you know, sign us to a deal. Of course, that never, never materialized. Um, but it didn't stop me wanting to continue in music we played parties and uh and recorded and then you know i graduated we all went our separate ways and to another band after i was in the air force um and again you know slogging through bars and practicing on friday nights when you should be you know out on dates and things yeah um <laughs> so that uh you know that kind of again more experience playing live um but i wanted to start recording on my own and uh, at the time, you know, as a lieutenant, 
in the Air Force, you don't make a ton of money. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, uh, I bought um, a little four track cassette recorder and uh, set about trying to record uh, my, my stuff with that. And um, since I was a singer songwriter type of person, even though I was in rock bands, um, my, my true love was always sort of the Dan Fogelberg sort of acoustic bass singer songwriter stuff. So mm -hmm. um, that was good. I didn't have to try to record electric guitar and bass and drums and things um, too much with the, uh, with the four track cassette recorder. But, um, you know, it was crap. I, I figured out over <laughs> time how to make it less crap. Um, and then, uh, you know, I just kept doing that. I found a group of, of folks that could be my audience. And we joined, uh, my wife was a member of this medieval recreation group. And so I started listening to singer songwriters from Scotland and, uh, in Ireland and England and things and Canada that did Very a lot cool. of, yeah, some just awesome songwriting skills and just terrific songs and, uh, and, and wonderful musicians. So I started, uh, recording a couple of albums that were cop that were mostly uh, cover songs from them with, with like one or two covers or one or two original ones thrown in. Um, and I would sell them to our group, um, in the medieval, um, you know, market mostly they were our, our niche audience. So that's really the best mm -hmm. advice for musicians out there trying to market themselves is if you can find a niche audience, boy, that's, that's really the way to kind of make it on your own um, yeah. as a musician. I don't know, you know, I'm not driving big cars and living in big houses, but I do um, sell music, um, you know, all the time. Yeah, and you put food on the table. <laughs> yeah, and it's on autopilot too. A lot of the stuff nowadays, um, you know, CD Baby doing distribution and you doing promotion um, and playing live a few times a year at, uh, at a few times a year at big events. You know, you get uh, you get to, you know, making a little money. It's 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 OK. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, as far as recording, you want to get to the recording part. That part is just really over over the years, over the last 30, 40 years, um, <laughs> you know, you get a little better with each project. You figure out why one thing mm -hmm. didn't sound good and how can I make that sound good? Um, and you learn a lot of guerrilla tactics that, you know, a lot of people who, who are um, classically trained engineers, if there is such a thing, you know, people who go and learn um, audio stuff from from schools and they come back and they go, well, that isn't right. That's not how that's supposed to. Is. I don't know. I just did what sounded good. And, uh, yeah. you know, and over the over the years, that's kind of how I've developed um, how to is it by necessity. I was poor mm -hmm. um, or, or I didn't have a lot of money. I certainly wasn't going to waste my time going to commercial studios anymore. And I got to the point where I sounded at least as good as the recordings that were coming out of those studios I was going to. So I figured, all right, you know, if it takes me a little more time, so what? I have more time than money. So uh, so that was that was good. I was able to um, figure out how to make things sound good with the with the cheapest gear and uh, and the most spare um, setup. And that I love yeah, it. That has served me well, because, of course, then when you can afford the better gear, things are going to sound that much better. So I don't know. In, Absolutely. Um, that's that kind of, I guess, encapsulates most of the of the music and the recording stuff. Very cool. So obviously a lot of experience and trial and error and just doing a lot of different things and sort of building your skill set uh, and, and doing it, you know, without that $10,000 mic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or whatever. I still don't have a $10,000 mic. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, today we want to talk about getting pro sound specifically in a home studio environment you know what you were just kind of talking about which is you know something that everybody wants and i'm curious in your mind what separates pro sound versus amateur and not so good is it is it the muddiness is it poor blend is it loudness is it a combination of everything uh obsessive compulsive disorder <laughs> <laughs> I say that only half joking. Um, there are a lot of musicians who are just as good as we are in in this um, sort of niche that I'm talking about. This this medieval group I'm talking about is Society of Creative Anachronism. So it's kind of a you go to these events, you put on armor and fight, or you go to these taverns and whatever. I mean, it's a it's not like Ren Fair stuff where it's where it's for tourists. It's for our sure. own thing. 
So we make our own music too. And there are other musicians who are also recording. And some of them, uh, there's one from Canada that's, uh, you know, she's a pro. And so her stuff always sounds great. Uh, Heather Dale is her name. And she's also fairly well known in Canada as a singer songwriter outside the sort of medieval space. But Mm -hmm. the, um, the other people, when I listen to their recordings, yeah, there are a few things that really stand out. Um, one of them is just musically, they don't pay enough attention to how things, you know, how, when you hear that band is really tight, yeah. you know, because the drummer and the bass player and the guitar player, they listen to each other and, and, and the kick drum and the bass are always right together. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're always together and very, very tight when they play. Um, well, a lot of us who record on our own, you know, we, we just layer things. We record a guitar part and then another guitar part and then the bass and then maybe some drums and then we'll add all the vocals and all the other extra instruments and sort of build it that way. Sure. Well, people, people don't pay attention to how these things, how these things play against each other, not just tonally, because uh, most musicians who do any recording at all know that you have to do some deconflicting of things like the bass and the kick drum yeah. to, you know, so they don't, you know, drown each other out. Um, but a sort of lack of the idea of just rhythmically, wow, you guys aren't even on beat with the drum, you know, how can you, I I don't understand it to me. I don't know if it's OCD or not, but when I hear something and the drum is not quite going along, some things are not quite in sync with each other. It drives me mad. Mm -hmm. So, um, a little bit of that, I think a little bit of just a sense of how things need to work and play well together is, is a big part of it. And, um, the other part of it is tones, and that's a, a term I use because when I sent something to Recording Magazine back in the 90s, <laughs> and the the guy who used to review the the recordings that you sent in used to use that term a lot, and it, he said the tones are good, the tones are there, and that was like, yeah, awesome, you know, that's that's kind of the the thing you want. Right. And what does that mean, tones? Well, things should sound the way they're supposed to sound. I know it sounds really ridiculous to say it that way, but a voice should sound like that's what it should sound like if the guy was five feet in front of you singing Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the guitar should sound like, you know, either he's got two guitar players, one on either side, you know, kind of going for a stereo sound or whatever, or he's just got one, but, but it should sound like the guy's really playing guitar and he's right there. Um, the bass should sound like a bass. Everything has its own sort of, um, frequency response if you look Mm -hmm. on you know there's these things are all over like pinterest now Uh, whatever instrument it'll show you what the frequencies are for that instrument i wish i had this one when i was first starting out so you know how to how to shape things to where the um a tambourine does not step all over a Mm hi-hat so you can't hear the hi-hat anymore or this voice you can hear but those voices you can't hear for some reason you know why are they not paying attention to this you should be able (laughs) to hear everything um, and, uh, and everything just gets jammed together and it doesn't work and play well together. And it sounds thin because tonally things are covering other things up and you can't, mm-hmm. you can't hear everything the way you should. Um, and another, I'd say third thing. So the first thing was that rhythmically things don't work well together and I don't know why, but that seems to be a trend. Um, the other thing is tonally things, things aren't shining through. Because I think people don't understand frequency and how to use EQ a little bit, not not to go crazy, but just to, you know, allow the space for everything to come through and be heard. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is people don't know how to use the stereo field very well. Mm -hmm. Everything seems to be jammed up in the middle and uh, and and you can't hear everything spread out. And, you know, if they if they understood that last thing, they could help with. The previous thing, you know, that the separating things out and using pan very well in a stereo field can really help spread things out so you can hear them better. So, you know, things sound thin and uh, and sort of jammed up in the middle. And I hope that these terms that I'm using aren't too um, metaphor and, uh, and that they make sense, but that's the, well, the it makes perfect sense to me. It really does. And, you know, the only other thing that I might add to that is, and, and you were kind of talking about this. I, I really think that one of the things you should try to go for when you are recording and mixing is just imagine that perfect performance, you know, and you're standing in the perfect spot to listen to that band or whatever, and everything's got good space and it's, it's just sounds great. And you've got all those great tones as you were talking about, that's what you should kind of go for. Of course, you know, if you're trying to be creative and do other crazy things, you can do that. But, uh, I think sometimes people lose track of that and they're just kind of like, well, I'm just layering stuff and I'm doing this. Uh, and it's like, 
but imagine a really perfect performance. Would it sound that way? I don't know. That's what I think. Yeah, that no, you're right. Um, and um, another another thing to throw in there, just just for if if people aren't musicians, because mm-hmm. it's not all about you know a lot of home recording people are are voiceover people, and that's that's really kind of uh, the audience that lately I've been I've been talking to, mm-hmm. and uh, we talked about pro sound. Well, there's pro sound in the mix sector, like we just talked about a little bit. You're mixing music. How do you make that sound good? Um, but the pro sound for each individual tone sort of goes in both worlds, the voiceover world and the music world. And, and that I've, I've got something on, on the site there, um, which I can, uh, send you, send you a URL later. Sure. But on homebrewaudio.com. It's a, um, there's a free download there that's called six mostly free tips that to make your audio sound expensive. Nice. And uh, yeah, it's, it's basically the things that I've learned that whether you're doing voiceover or whether you're recording a piano or, um, or, or an acoustic guitar or whatever it is, the, the distance from the mic, especially if you're in your crappy room, like most home recording people are, mm-hmm. we're mostly in bedrooms um, that are square and boxy and lots of uh, room sound reverb, that kind of thing. That's the big bane. So you want to try to minimize that. And I don't know if you can hear it, but in the background, I have some sort of uh, wood chipper or some sort of thing going on out there. i uh, got to try to avoid those things too. But um, anyway, the, <laughs> the idea of, of things like getting closer to the mic um, mm-hmm. where you get less room sound, things like that, um, making sure that you use the right kind of mic. Um, yes. Uh, making sure that you uh, have, that your room is, if you can... And I said mostly free and most of these things are, you know, use a a cardioid mic and point it at whatever source, like your computer fan or whatever, so that the null will be to the loudest thing in the room. Um, You know, if you can't afford acoustic panels on your walls, then maybe put up a mattress. And there's the old, you know, get under a blanket thing that Mm -hmm. sounds so stupid, but it actually works really well to help knock down room sound. I love it. I love it. I do that. I have a I have an acoustic shield and I'll put my mic there and I'll actually take a blanket Yes. And kind of put that over the acoustic shield and tuck myself right up under there. It and, works. Uh, it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the other thing that people make a mistake, both in music and voiceover, is they go, oh, I got a big closet. I'm going to go go in there and record in there because I can get rid of the wood chipper and the bird and the, and the leaf blower. Um, but the problem is that most closets make your audio sound boxy. Like mm-hmm. you're, you know, a little bit of sounding like you're <laughs> like that. And yeah. so there's no, there's not enough space for the, for the, um, the air molecules to move around in there. Now you can w- make it work if you've got enough acoustic treatment, but you're just taking the boxy problem and you're making it worse by enclosing yourself in a box without any acoustic treatment. So I try to encourage people not to do that. For but, sure. Yeah. But that's, you know, those are, those are probably the biggies. That's awesome. Um, so you actually, basically, I think that kind of answers uh, my next question, which is, you know, on your site's homepage, you have these two recordings compared, one with a $500 mic and the other with a $5 mic. And spoiler alert, the $5 mic sounds better. And so, you know, in addition to this, was there anything else for someone who is on a budget that that could make that $5 mic sound better than the $500 mic? Or is it all just about what you just mentioned, really? Well, I mean, the things I mentioned are part of it, but I'll tell you specifically what happened with the five five hundred dollar mic setup versus the sure. $5 mic. Um, I have a fr- this was an accident. This was nothing that I set out to do. And that makes it all the better because I wasn't doing anything special to try to prove a point. I was recording my first course, which was how to use um, how to how to record better audio if you're on a budget, which I came up with the newbie's guide to audio recording awesomeness. Um, And it was okay. If you have no budget, you can do this with a $5 mic and you can do it with, uh, you know, your computer sound card and you can do it with um, the, uh, let's see the, with audacity, free, free recording software. So let me show you what you can do with that. So I put a course together with that. And so I'd recorded the narration for the videos using one of those. It literally was a, a $5 microphone. It's this little, you know, it had a little foam hat on it, but it was a plastic mic that, <laughs> uh, on a little headset that I bought from, from Target that plugs right into the sound card. And of course, the, the hiss and the electronic noise is hellacious on those things. Plus, mm-hmm. you really do sound like you're talking, you know, it's really thin sounding. Yeah. You know, you can only do so much with that kind of mic. But what I wanted to show was, yeah, but you can do better than you think. 
Mm-hmm. And so I I just went through every time I recorded an audio, I went through and did, you know, really, really intense noise reduction to get rid of all of the um, electronic noise or the hiss as much of it as I could. And then I would use a little EQ to, to boost a little bit of the low end so that my voice sounded a little less thin. And I wasn't, I was, mm-hmm. wasn't trying to make it sound professional. I was just trying to make it sound better. And I even put on the videos, look, I'm using the same setup that I'm telling you you can use. This is a $5 mic on a, at the time. It was a, I don't know, a computer from 2004 or something like that, you know, Windows XP. It was, it was just a regular setup. And Mm -hmm. then my friend who was like, ah, he went out and bought some mic interface that was $300 and a $250 Audio-Technica large diaphragm condenser mic. And he recorded this little voiceover for something that he was doing and he sent it to me. And I was like, how in the world did you manage to make that audio sound crappy when you have (laughs) all of this gear? And um, he did everything wrong that you could do wrong. Um, one of the things was he, he recorded at too low a level. Mm. So, so w- after he recorded it, he decided he would use like audacity to turn everything way up. So that was the first problem. The second problem w- was that he recorded into the backside, not the front side of, <laughs> of his, his microphone. And you know what? Yeah. Since then, <laughs> lots, when you're, if you're using a large diaphragm condenser mic, um, those things are symmetrical and it isn't obvious to, to Mm -hmm. anyone who looks at it. The last person I worked with to try to figure out why his audio didn't sound good. It took us a couple of weeks to figure out, Oh dude, you're not recording into the backside of the mic. Are you? And this guy's got like a PhD. I mean, it's, it's something that smart people do all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's actually one of my six tips. So yeah, he had recorded that. So there was lots of room sound in it and noise. And then when it recorded at a low level, all his voice and the noise, of course, he cranked up. So all the noise came up with it. And, uh, oh, yeah. and it just sounded, oh, I can't even describe how awful it is. But if you go to the front page of the home, the homes of the homepage, I think it's there. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, most people think there are only two ways to get that professional audio sound, blah, blah, blah. And I have two little sound samples there. Uh, can you tell a difference? And mine did sound better. I mean, there's everybody who listens to it says so. They either say that or they say they can't tell the difference. And mm-hmm. when you're talking a difference of $495, um, then that's, that's saying something right there. But literally, that was just noise reduction, getting really, really close to the mic um, and, uh, and a little bit of EQ to, you know, to make it sound a, a little less thin. And that was it. I mean, that wasn't a mm-hmm. whole lot of uh, fancy technical stuff. So yeah, that was, that was the reason. So yeah, if you can learn, the big lesson there is, A, buying expensive gear isn't going to guarantee. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, I'm, I just noticed that I was flipping when I was talking to the mic here because I'm getting all excited. Um, <laughs> buy, buying expensive gear isn't going to guarantee you good, good audio quality. And the second thing is that before you buy expensive gear, figure out how to make the, whatever you're using now sound decent because it can be done. And once you figure out how to make cheap gear sound decent, then you can graduate to buying the more expensive gear and then it'll sound truly awesome. Absolutely. And I love that. And, 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 you know, there's a whole industry out there that they're trying to sell you that expensive gear. And so there's folks who will say, well, no, this is going to give you the, the greatest sound ever. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's going to get you a, a, a $500 mic is better than a $5 mic. Objectively, yes. But, but the skills and, and the things you're actually doing with that $500 versus $5 mic are going to take you a lot further in terms of sound quality. So it's not, it's not so simple as, well, I spent $500. Now, where's, where's my, my Grammy? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. So... I wanted to ask you, you know, compression is one of those things that a lot of folks feel is kind of this mystical key to getting pro sound, you know, when in truth, sometimes not using compression and doing more maybe manual compression with things like automation can be better. You've written articles actually advocating against using compression for things like a voiceover job. Mm-hmm. How can folks know when they should compress or not? That's a that's the question right there. 
if you don't know why yeah. you're you're compressing, then you shouldn't do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I went through this because I, as a, a lot of enthusiasts do, read the magazines and everybody talks about, well, then I did compression and then I did, you know, so it sounds like it's a mandatory step in the process. And for music recording, there are certain things that, yeah, I mean, you're going to want compression on the lead vocal, period. It's, it's going to sure. be a rare vocalist who can work the mic well enough in a studio. And even then, it's not necessarily up to them. Uh, it depends on what happens in the mix. So in order to make sure that that voice is front and center and audible at all times, um, you're going to want to do some compression. But the other thing I learned, luckily very early on, is that compressors are, are apt to leave behind certain artifacts and um, sort of evidence that they were there. And mm-hmm. that isn't always a good thing because they can cause problems with things like sibilance. Uh, if you over compress something, then it's 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 likely to have more, you know, hot S's, you know, a lot of mm-hmm. stuff that's um, that's unpleasant. And uh, a lot of these common things like pumping in the in the voice, it can bring up the noise in the floor uh, in the, the noise floor can be brought up. So the noise is more audible. And if you overdo mm-hmm. it, you know, the breaths can sound really bizarre and alien like. So there are just so many things that can go wrong. So the real lesson is don't don't compress unless you know why you're compressing. And now that, that does not follow that you have to understand how a compressor works before you use it, because you mentioned manual compression. And I'll explain what that is very briefly. When I do voiceover stuff, um, I do a lot of manual compression because, look, all you're looking for is a natural sounding voice usually. Sometimes people want something right in your face if it's a movie, if it's a you know something that they want to be right in your face, you know, in a world where you know all that. Kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, you may want to use compression as an effect in that case, but for the most part, it's e-learning stuff. It's it's explainer videos. They want it natural sounding, but they also want it to be audible. If they want, if they're going to put uh, music over the top of it or whatever, so you want it to be even in volume, somewhat at least. And you also want it to be very audible. So you want to be able to maximize the volume, the average volume of the, of the track. So what I do is I bring it into an editor. Uh, you can do this thing in a DAW, like in Reaper, but I prefer to do, do this, this last thing I'm going to talk about here, this thing I'm going to talk about in, or, in an editor like uh, Adobe Audition or even, or even uh, um, the free one, Audacity. Is you look at your audio first. That's a great thing about now. Is in the old days you couldn't look at it. Now you can see, which is awesome. You can see the spikes. You might have in a in a five minute vocal. You might have three or four or five times when you really blasted and you you know maybe on the chorus or something your voice gets loud or in the voiceover you got to an exciting part or or a part you want to emphasize and the voice spikes up to close to clipping. And so those, mm-hmm. those three or four spots in a five minute video are going to be the maximum volume of your whole thing. So you can turn those down, just those four places or five, just uh, in Adobe Audition makes it easy. You just highlight it and a little volume knob um, appears on the screen and you just, you just drag that a little bit and it turns down only what you've highlighted. It's the, one of the best things about Adobe Audition. And then you can squeeze that down just a couple of dB so that it's closer to the average and do that for all five spikes or however many spikes there are. And then you can normalize everything, um, which means you turn all the audio up until the loudest part is just the loudest it can possibly be. So everything gets turned up by the same amount, um, but only to the point where the loudest part would just before it clips, just before it's too loud. And that I think gives you a natural sounding voice that is also loud enough to be heard. And that's what I do norm- normally for voiceover stuff. Um, when I am working on music, however, you mentioned automation, and I use the heck out of that. I, I, mm-hmm. I use a very, very gentle um, EQ on, on Reaper. I just use the stock plugin that comes with it on a vocal, ReQ, it's called, or, or re- ReComp. And so I just put like a three to one ratio, and uh, I, I put. Um, like a like a negative 20 or negative 15 even um, threshold. So it doesn't give it a huge amount, but it does even out the volume a little. But especially when it's my wife singing, she's got she's got some, you know, when she sings loud, it cuts through everything. 
And uh, if, if I don't go through and manually or individually, I should say, take care of those things without feeding it through a compressor, without taking the entire compressor program for the entire length of the vocal and treating it mm-hmm. this way, I just want those areas that are, that are, we call it pressing on our ears. It's that part is pressing on our ears. It makes it, it's actually physically painful or discomfort, <laughs> uncomfortable to listen to. And I'll go through and use envelopes, volume envelopes. And if, uh, I don't know if, if that's something that everybody understands, but you bring up like a mirror track underneath the audio track. And what it is, is just a line and you can put little dots on the line and you can drag them up or down. And if you drag up, um, it makes whatever audio is above it louder. And if you drag down, it makes whatever audio is below it um, softer or less loud. And I go through, it takes a while. I go through and use that and then I'll listen to it. And if, and then I'll put it in the car and listen. And oh, okay, and I'll write down this word on that phrase is still poking out. That word on that phrase is still mm-hmm. poking out. Come back, and I've already got the envelope. All I have to do is drag the envelope down a little more. And if something isn't as audible in a couple of places, I'll just drag that envelope up a little more. And that is a way to manually compress using automation. Again, I'm not relying on a compressor to treat the whole voice because guess what? The whole voice doesn't need it. It's just mm-hmm. those areas that are that just can't be heard through the mix for some reason, just those three words. Why, why adjust a compression setting for the entire vocal when only three words in a five-minute vocal are the ones giving you problems? So wow. it wasn't like yeah, I think that's had to build awesome a block. You, know, you wanted to know what time yeah. it was. But <laughs> you can over-compress, and, things, and, and I did it. Everyone who learns about compression goes, oh, i got to get me a compressor. You know? And then they over-compress until they learn about what compression is. And, how it can be used for good, uh, but how it also can be used for evil. Yes, with with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> so, okay, that's compression. EQ is another one of those things that people sometimes maybe struggle with, or they're just not sure what moves they should make. In your opinion, you know, what's the best way to dial in EQ settings? Are you, you know, a big fan of of using the EQ to boost and sweep to find those nasty frequencies that you'll then cut? Are you someone who says, oh, I, I never boost anything or I always cut things? Uh, you know, what, what's your sort of EQ philosophy? It boils down first to the same philosophy of any effect. Don't use it just because. Just because you mm-hmm. heard that you're supposed to use it and you should use it. If you don't know why you're using it, then, then don't because it'll be more natural. Um, that said, though, I do agree that, you know, just as a rule of thumb, don't go out and say, well, Ken says you should, you know, because every, every recording is different and uh, every need is different. But for the most part, mm-hmm. I am going to be cutting, reducing more than I am boosting. In almost every case, because I mostly what I use EQ for is a tool to make things to, to make things sound not as bad. I know that there are a lot of engineers who use EQ because, well, a vocal can really benefit from boosting, you know, the air up in the sort of 10 kilohertz range or whatever. And so just as a matter of course, every vocal, before they even hear it, they'll just go and they'll just, you know, boost uh, a shelf up around, you know, 10 to 12 kilohertz or something. Um, I, you know, I don't like just doing stuff like that. Yeah. Um, one, one uh, you, you, you talked about sweeping until you find the frequency. There's this whole idea when you listen to a mix of that thing, whether it's a bass or whether it's a a vocal, it's usually one of those two things. Sometimes it's an instrument, but almost always it's a bass or a vocal is really it's unpleasant for whatever reason. It's either too loud. And so it's uh, it's resonating my eardrums out of my skull or or it's ripping my sinuses out. (laughs) It's just like, oh, that is loud. And it actually physically hurts whenever you say that word. So if, if the, uh, the compression doesn't work for that, then yeah, what I'll do is, this is something I learned from uh, recording magazine back in the day, is I will highlight, put on headphones to do this, or you'll drive your cats and or your spouse crazy. Um, <laughs> put on headphones and find the, highlight the, the thing, whether it's a word or a phrase or, a, um, you know, whatever, whatever is unpleasant and just loop it and listen to it in the headphones and then go and uh, and boost the EQ. Just use a regular sort of, uh, you know, EQ with a 
normal size bandwidth, you know, a little bell shaped curve. Um, and, uh, and usually what I'll do is I'll shrink that bell shaped curve down to where the bandwidth is really narrow so that I can find out and zero in on the exact frequency that's causing me the pain. And when I say pain, that is because I will boost it by about 20 decibels just for this particular for a phase. So I'll start and it'll be just be looping, go, you know, here to chat, here to chat, here to chat, whatever it is. And it's going over and over. <laughs> and then I'll slide it mm -hmm. slowly to the left. You, you need to kind of have um, the ability to do that. Certain EQs only give you um, up and down, um, you know, the graphic EQ programs that just have the sliders. You don't want that. You're going to need an EQ that has uh, curves and little lines that you can, you can drag the frequency left and right. Um, it used to be that those uh, parametric, they're called parametric EQs were, ah, they're very expensive, but now they're just, you know, the stock yeah. EQ can do that, you know, in Reaper. So I'll, I'll raise it up really high, about 20 decibels, and then I'll start dragging it a little bit to the left, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the left, until it gets to the point where it is the most painful. You don't want to get it so loud that you're going to damage your eardrums. So let me just get that disclaimer out of the way. <laughs> you don't want to damage your eardrums, but you do want right. it to be loud enough to where it's like, oh my God, that's the frequency right there. And you can usually find two or three frequencies usually that are pretty narrow. So you can, you can zoom right in. Oh man, that is right at 2.139 kilohertz or whatever. You know, you can just... I drag it and find out that that's the one frequency that's causing my brain to explode whenever it happens. Now that you've found the frequency, now just drag it down below the center line to reduce it. Mm -hmm. And then turn everything back on and listen to it in situ in the mix and see, is it still unpleasant? And, uh, and that's the way to zero in on things. Um, and then a lot of times that there's, this is kind of a three-part answer. I don't know if I made it you know, one is mostly I cut. Um, the second thing is I zero in and I use this sweeping idea and find the most, um, you know, aggressively unpleasant uh, frequency. And that's where I want to do, do some cutting. Um, and then the mm -hmm. other thing is certain things don't have any useful energy uh, below a certain frequency range. For example, on an acoustic guitar, if it's just by itself, I will just, I won't do any EQ. If, if a song, say, starts with an acoustic guitar in the, in the intro, no bass, no drums, nothing, um, then uh, yeah, there's mm -hmm. no EQ usually. I'm, I might, for acoustic guitar, I, I might add some stuff up in the, in the upper range to give it a little bit more, you know, nice of a higher frequency, whatever. But so acoustic guitar is playing. As soon as the bass comes in, most of the frequencies mm -hmm. in the acoustic guitar below sort of 250 hertz are just about useless now. Because everything that the bass, mm -hmm. all the energy that the bass is bringing forward, you want that to come through. Um, usually it's below 100 hertz, but anything up to sort of 200 hertz, let the bass take care of that. And so I think I, I usually put a, um, a filter. So I'm literally cutting frequencies from the acoustic guitar below 150 or so. So they're gone. It wouldn't sound good by itself. Mm -hmm. But once the bass comes in, any frequency that from the acoustic guitar that shares frequencies with the bass is mostly just going to be getting in the way of the bass and it's not adding anything. So that's just one of those ideas of um, uh, make, uh, letting things shine through and not letting one thing that isn't doing you much good anyway get in the way of something else. So that's, uh, again... Wow, those are some fantastic techniques. Yeah, I, I and mean, you'll it. be surprised how clean, how much cleaner the mix will sound. And, you know, I'm going to give a shout out to some of my, I don't know, you could call them competitors, I guess, but um, things, things about, like, I learned that from Bjorgvin um, over at audioissues.com. I learned... Oh, I know him. Yeah, He's great. I learned that from one of, his, uh, one of his articles. And I was like, whoa, that is a killer tip. And, uh, and so, you know, I think giving his, uh, giving his site, he and, um, Graham Cochran are, are the two guys that, you know, when you talk about mixing and the stuff that I'm kind of getting into right now, those guys have a mm -hmm. lot of experience doing only this, you know, I'm, I'm more, I think I've, uh, if, if I'm separating myself from, from those guys, cause they're great at what they do is I'm, I'm more focusing on the tones and getting better quality in the individual tones and making things sound better in a home studio um, individually, make that mic give you better quality on, on its own. Um, and, uh, and, and then focusing a lot on voiceover folks because 
no music mm-hmm. to cover up the voice. You know, a friend of mine <laughs> in the marketing world, Dan Thies, he said, yeah, in a voiceover, the recording can't suck for even a second. And I love that quote. Right. You know, so, but anyway, that's, I'm, I'm veering off now. But yeah, that, that's sort of uh, the EQ thing. Use it to fix problems. I use it to, to cut out in, um, in voiceover. I use it to cut out P-pops because even with a pop filter, mm-hmm. those are going to get through. And so if you set up an EQ with uh, going from about 250 and sloping down to nothing and then apply that to your P-pops, boom, they're gone for the most part. Um, and then yeah. uh, you, I don't know if you can if it's coming through today because I'm kind of sneaking bites of oatmeal while I'm talking to you. Um, you get these little mouth noises in your especially the voice. right? Oh, yeah. These little saliva clicks and what have you. I used my vo- uh, EQ trick I just mentioned to find the most common saliva frequency. And uh, w- when I hear that in the voice, I just zero, zero in on it, um, on that sort of 10, micro, 10 milliseconds or whatever it is that, uh, that contains the saliva click, and I'll zap it with that EQ. And that, Wait, so do people have different saliva frequencies? I would be surprised if they didn't. <laughs> or, or is I would one? be surprised if they didn't, <laughs> yes. That's interesting. <laughs> so... Okay, we talked about compression, we talked about EQ. One of the things as it applies to, you know, trying to get a pro sounding recording, I notice definitely beginners struggle with this, but I I notice a lot of uh, tracks and mixes sometimes they just drown their tracks in reverb and other effects. And then this often ends up making the, the project sound, you know, just amateur and bad and 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 just everything is it's like you want to throw them a life preserver it's like oh my gosh what advice might you have for folks to use audio effects better and get and get it use them so they can sound like more pro i think that there are certain Again, it goes back to the idea of know why you're using it instead of just well it's a vocal it's got to have reverb because then you have to answer the question, mm-hmm. what kind of reverb? There's 110,000 million different reverb sounds and uh, different reverb sort of programs out there too. So what do you do? Um, the, I think, come back to basics. The idea is that you're trying to give whatever it is you're applying the reverb to, you're doing it for a reason. Two reasons, actually. First time, the first thing is you can use reverb as a tool to help push something back into a mix. If it's, if it's a little too upfront uh, and it's, um, you know, you don't want it emphasized, but you also don't want to mess with the volume or the EQ or anything, you can use some reverb to help sort of fade it back in the background a little bit more. That's, that's one thing. But um, to answer the question that you're, mm-hmm. you're talking about, yeah, I think everybody goes through this. I sure did. I wanted to reverb on everything because reverb sounds awesome, you know. <laughs> But then you listen to <laughs> right. listen to your favorite songs. Yeah, there's going to be reverb on the lead vocal, especially if the music drops away and you have a little section where where the lead vocal is on its own, is on its own. But what you don't have in those, I think of Pink, um, something recent. You know so that uh, you know you listen to to the sound of their voice when there isn't any instrument. And yeah, there's going to be reverb, but it usually isn't isn't a wash in it. It's usually there to create a little sort of halo around the voice and give this sort of space that it does sound like that you're in. You'd expect to see pink in a, in a stadium or in a, you know, a large sort of space like right. that. And, and the sound of her coming over a microphone would probably have sort of this nice reverb that just fills the space that's around you. And it just enhances the sound of the voice. That's really what you want to do. When, when you just slap a reverb on something um, and it makes it sound like it's con- you're singing in a basketball gym or, or you're singing in the bathroom <laughs> or something, unless you really want yeah. that effect, because, you know, there are people out there who are going for special effects. Um, if you're not going for a special effect, you just want it to sound like it should be on the radio, then, yeah, lead vocals will eight times out of 10, I'm not going to say always have a reverb on it and it will sound, um, but it will enhance the sound. It'll make it sound a little bigger and a little sort of this just beautiful. It'll make it sound more beautiful. Um, but it's gotta be the right reverb and it can't be too much. 
it is so easy to overdo all of these things. Yeah. Compression and, and reverb is another thing. You can almost always tell, like you mentioned, in an amateur recording, there's too much compression, there's too much reverb. So my advice mm -hmm. is don't use re the same reverb on everything in your, in your mix. So if you've got a certain reverb setting and a, and a reverb program even that you're using on a lead vocal, it's probably not going to be appropriate for your acoustic guitar. You might want to use something a little different yeah. for the acoustic guitar. And you know what? Sometimes dry is awesome. And this, this took me a Absolutely. while to figure out. My wife was playing me an album from this songwriter back in the 80s. And she had a group called Wild Choir. I wish I could remember the name of the, the lady who put the group together. But they had these intense vocal harmonies. And they, they had this one song where it ended. All the, the instruments fell away. And it was this, you know, woman singing and she had, you know, she had four background singers. It was this beautiful three-part harmony, gorgeous. And um, it just stopped at the end and there was no reverb. It was just totally dry. And there was something kick-ass about the sound of totally dry vocal mm -hmm. harmony in a pop song, which was just, wow. So, you know, explore that possibility. Um, Jeff Lynn from ELO, and uh, hopefully that's not too dated for people. <laughs> Electric Light Orchestra, yeah. I know ELO. I mean, he's back touring <laughs> with, uh, with uh, Jeff Lynn's ELO right now, too, a lot of those hits. Um, a lot of his, you know, it's not 100%, but he didn't like to put reverb on his voice. A lot of times his voice is dry as a bone when he, when he sings um, on, on his recordings. And so there are people out there who don't use any reverb at all, and it's still on the radio, and it still sounds good. So, there you again, go. It's, uh, it's, it's down to what you think you sh is going to make your stuff sound good. And don't use too much of it. Whatever you do, don't use too much of it. What I've uh, what recently done is yeah. I've used just enough to give it some space while the music is playing. And when the music is playing, you don't even know mm -hmm. there's reverb. And then when the, when the music stops, if there's an acapella part, then you can hear, oh, okay, yeah, there's some, there's some reverb on the voice. But um, what it does is it helps to give it some space in the mix. And, uh, and if you can hear the reverb when it's in the mix, ask yourself if it might not be too much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that is great, great advice, Ken. So I've got one more question for you. And... I think, you know, we learn the most from our mistakes and, you know, you've talked about your, your time just learning and, and all these things you've said, oh, I've done that. I've over compressed, you know, I've had it too much reverb. So, okay. What's the biggest mistake either you've made or you've seen made when it comes to recording and mixing and maybe how can that be avoided? Like I said earlier, there are so many, you know, especially, yeah. <laughs> especially when you didn't come up with a mentor saying, don't do that. Uh, yeah. You have to make so many of your same mistakes um, over, and over and over again before you figure out what the heck's going wrong. One of the biggest things that I was doing wrong back in the days of the, the um, cassette recording that went from making it sound meh to making it sound really good was mm -hmm. to understand that when I thought something was in stereo, it wasn't. I was I, mm. I thought I was recording certain things in stereo, but it wasn't. And looking back on it, I was like, how could I have been such an idiot? You know, <laughs> but I was just learning. And um, I tried recording into two mics at the same time, but of course they were going to the same track. So really it was doing nothing. And, right. and so I just had a mono source there. Um, and I mentioned earlier using using the uh, the stereo field to spread things out, and that really made the biggest impact when I started to learn about stereo. And there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to know. It isn't just well, you have stuff coming out of both speakers, so it's stereo. That is not true, because even a mono file will come out of both speakers. It's uh, right, you know, unless you have it panned all the way left or right or whatever, but if you want to take a mix that sounds thin and you're able to, if you're not mastering a two track, if you know, if you have all the source tracks from somebody and that mix sounds thin, take a look at where the panning is. You may find that you can 
you can make that thing sound 10 times better just by panning things in the stereo field and making it wider. And again, like everything else, this isn't, this isn't something that is um, like the one holy grail, but it was the thing that made the biggest, I think, the biggest impact in my recording was understanding what stereo was and what it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And one other thing that is a mistake that people make and that I made too is that once I learned how to, how to make something sound wider because it was now giving a, a stereo sound or, or maybe even a, a faux stereo sound, but at least it was sounded bigger because it was wider in the stereo field, is I wanted to everything. I wanted everything now to be in stereo. <laughs> hey, I found this thing. It's a great thing. Now let's make everything. So, <laughs> so the, I've heard it said, and it's very true, if everything is in stereo, nothing is in stereo. <laughs> because now everything is out wide and there's nothing in the middle and you get this big yeah. donut in your mix, except maybe the lead vocal is in the middle, but then people are like, Oh, how about I do a stereo lead vocal? I'll double track it and I'll pan, both <laughs> you know, and then you just, everything is stereo and now everything is still thin. It's just thin twice over on the left and on the right. Um, so you have to decide what things in your mix are going to be stereo and what things are going to be pinpoints that are just panned left 50%, left 70%, left 100%, and same thing on the right. Make sure it's balanced, like lead vocals. I never make a lead vocal stereo. However, I will put, um, I mean, harmony vocals. Scratch that. Lead vocal is, uh, but I never do lead vocal stereo either. I hardly ever double track a lead vocal and and spread it at all. It's usually just a single Mm -hmm. sound source and it's dead center. The harmony vocals, however, are spread in the stereo field. And uh, so that has to be, in my mind, I'm kind of, you know, a a harmony. I think it should be in your face. And I think the harmony should be up front and not just in the background. So I love the vocal harmony to be um, like, uh, and those I will split into stereo. So if I have a low harmony, like I have a, um, um, a couple of harmony experiments on my site where I recorded like uh, fat bottom girls, the intro to fat bottom girls from, from queen. You know? <laughs> Love it. And yeah. what queen used to do is they had three singers and they would take all three, Freddie and God, I can't remember the drummer's name, but anyway, um, uh, Brian and Freddie and the drummer, they would all sing each of the three parts. So in the studio, the low harmony would be sung by all three guys. Then the melody would be sung by all three guys. And then the high harmony would be sung by all three guys. So they had nine vocal parts and they would spread those out in the stereo field. So you'd have Brian on the left, Brian in the middle, Brian on the right for every vocal part. Or you could just take all of Brian's three parts and put them on the left, all of Freddie's three parts and put them in the middle. And all of, God, everyone's going to hate me for not knowing the drummer's name. But anyway, all of his parts on the right, you can, you can spread them out in the stereo field however you want to get an awesome vocal harmony sound um but um that's one way i use uh i use stereo a lot um on my acoustic guitar stuff it's almost always i i play it once and then i play it again and i split it hard left and right that's not a 100 percent rule because a lot of times you want an intimate one guitar one voice right down the center um but uh but for me i like the big wide stereo guitar um, mono. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, the drums, you know, obviously you're not going to make your, uh, an individual drum stereo, but if you have a drum kit, you're going to want to spread that out. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen this, this illustration before where if drums on stage really look like they sounded on, on the record, <laughs> you'd have a drummer with like 20 foot arms and, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the drum kit would be spread across the entire stage. Um, and that's kind of that's kind of what people do in the studio to make them big and wide. So uh, yeah, the kick drum, right kick on. drum, and the snare up the center, bass at the center, lead vocal up the center. Everything else spread out around that, large enough so that it sounds big, but not so large and so wide that it sounds sparse, and it doesn't sound very like uh, proscriptive there necessarily. But it's a general rule of thumb. And you got to, you got to kind of use it, but there are so many mistakes. I could talk about my mistakes. <laughs> we, could, we could do a whole nother episode Ben's on mistakes. <laughs> mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, of course, I, I already mentioned over, over compressing, over reverbing and all of that stuff. But I think the biggest thing was the, was the understanding stereo. Mm-hmm. For sure. 
Ken, I wanted to thank you so, so much for joining us today and really sharing some awesome techniques. Well, thank you for having me on. And, uh, you know, I do tend to ramble, so I do apologize for that. As you say, you can fix it in post, right? (laughs) No, I think it's going to be great. It's going to be great. (laughs) So thank you all so much for listening today. And as a reminder, for links and information about today's show and our guest, please check out our show notes at audioskills.com slash podcast. Now, wherever you are, whatever kind of music you're making, just go out there and make it great. Ready to go even deeper with your recording, mixing, and music production? We've got all the info and techniques you need in one place so you can turn it up. Go to audioskills.com and access a huge library of video tutorials and private workshops so you make progress even faster. Come back next week for a brand new episode of the Audio Skills Podcast.